Welcome, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and uh, with us here virtually, our dear brother Lloyd DeYoung. And I hope that you've been watching the previous shows of this fascinating series that we have uh, titled basically Islamic Sharia Law or Sharia Law, the Muslim Talmud. And every uh, video, every episode has its own unique title. Today's title, for instance, for this episode is The Four Imams, the Absolute Experts. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, we'll let Lloyd, of course, now unpack that for us. Lloyd, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much, al -Fadi. Glad to be here. So if you can give just a brief, brief overview once again, what do we mean by the four Imams? As Islam spread due to its conquests, they started to absorb varying geographies, varying cultures. And there was dissension, there was disagreement, but also there were different legal systems, different cultural ideas, which were coming into conflict within the Islamic empire. So you go to one place and they had different sets of rulings than another place. They had to form a consensus. They had to have one set of ideas that was consistent across the entire empire. And the Sharia is the greatest intellectual achievement of these Islamic scholars. It took in, in total roughly 900 years to complete. And there were four imams who are credited with, find, with founding these major schools of Islamic law, jurisprudence, that have become the dominant schools that have the most correct opinions. Now, I'm going to introduce this in pieces, and later on I'll come back to it and add more because it can be overwhelming. But we will talk about these four imams, we'll name them, we'll identify their status within Islam, and then we'll, you know, we'll, just, we'll also introduce some terminology today. Wonderful. So why did we call him the absolute experts? So let's have a quick look at my slide. Now, notice it states here, again, we're going back to the reliance of the traveler. Notice that these four imams are considered mujtahids mutlaq. You'll see this title up here, mujtahids mutlaq. They are absolute experts. So they are absolute experts in Islamic legal reasoning. They are mujtahids mutlaq. And these are Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmed. They are obliged to know what relates to every subject matter in Islamic law. So they are considered people who are guided, who are infallible, inerrant. They cannot make a mistake because, again, we've shown earlier that Allah's hand is over the group and they cannot make an error. So their word is final. This is the final understanding, the final interpretation of everything within the sources of Islam. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely that. fascinating to me, by the way, brother, because uh, it shows how Islam is man-made religion. And here we go. We're talking about mere men who are sinners, and somehow they have this absolute power to decide. That is correct. We will discuss them in more detail as we go through, but that is quite correct. So notice they mentioned that there, there used to be many, many schools of fiqh, or madhabs, as they are commonly called. But it is quite otherwise with the four schools whose imams have spent themselves in checking the positions of their schools. These are the four mujtahids mutlaq. Their scholars have achieved safety from textual corruption and have been able to discern the genuine from the poorly authenticated. They are saying that these are the only valid schools. These four schools are the only valid schools. Of course, Al-Azhar University, the Sunni world today, recognizes the Jafari school of the Shia. Right. But... These four schools, these four imams, are the only ones who have developed a trustworthy, reliable, correct understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. Only they are valid schools of fiqh. Yes. Now, if you'd like to jump in, please go ahead, Al Fadi. I'll be happy to have you do that. Now, I want to introduce some terminology. Ijtihad mutlaq, in law, the creative act of ijtihad. This is personal reasoning. So this is applying your thinking, your logic, to something that happened in the Quran, a situation, a scenario, a story. And how do we apply this to the life of the Muslim within the legal system, the Sharia and the Fiqh? So they did absolute reasoning, right? So this is a case of absolute reasoning through which the founding imams derived from the revealed sources a systematic structure of law. So the legal system of Islam was created by these four Imams who did absolute reasoning, perfect, unquestionable reasoning. Mutlaq means absolute as opposed to restricted, or muqayyad, general, right? as opposed to khas, which is um, specific. Now, in law, mutlaq is applied to the mujtahids of the heroic age. So these people have great standing. 
the founders of the schools who were called Mujtahid Mutlak, an epithet which none of them, a title, right? A title of honor, which none of them, which none after them has borne. No scholar after them has earned and can earn and can ever earn a title of this degree of honor and respect. Uh, your thoughts, Al-Fadi? Well, I mean, uh, it, again, I, um, I wanted to show our Muslim friends that why, why Islam is a man-made religion. Show me now, my friends, anything in the Quran, for instance, or the Hadith that pinpointed two, three, four, five people that received this status. Just show me, especially in the Quran. Nothing. The Quran talks about just the learned scholars in general, in general, not just specific one above the other and so on and so forth. Second of all, how in the world would you know that these particular men were the correct ones? What if there is someone else that has a better opinion than theirs? Why do we rely just on this? So it all has to do with popularity, nothing more than that. How many people, they, they follow them, uh, their status in, uh, uh, you know, social status at that time, and so on and so forth. So anything else I would consider to be nothing but baloney, actually, to say that these men somehow have this wisdom and knowledge to even understand things that the Prophet of Islam didn't even understand himself. Go ahead, in brother. fact, people conflate the terms madhab and fiqh. These are schools that correctly termed, these are schools of fiqh which is the application of the revealed law. The Sharia is the revealed law. What was revealed in the Quran, the Sunnah, the Hadith, basically, in the Quran. Right. The fiqh is taking these ideas and applying them to a legal system, creating this legal system that took hundreds and hundreds of years to develop. And, of course, there were disagreements, but, of course, these four scholars are the ones who became the most popular, as you stated. Now, in fact, the word fiqh is the correct term, jurisprudence. However, the term madhab has become popular, and when we look through, for instance, the Encyclopedia of Islam, what it tells us is that the word madhab, really, what it means is not jurisprudence. It means persuasion. They were the most persuasive. They founded the four most compelling schools of persuasion. Therefore, they are the most popular. Right. Right. Well said. All right. So now I want to bring up just briefly, I will mention theocratic systems and their difference with a Western legal system. So let's look at a theocratic system like Islam. Theocratic legal systems, right, basically have a revealed scripture, like the Torah for the Jews. Of course, you have the Quran for Muslims. They are prescribed rules of exegesis. So you take the revealed scripture and you run through prescribed rules of exegesis. And from there, you extrapolate a religio, political, legal and social system. This is what Islam is. Now, please understand, Islam does not call itself a religion. Under its own definitions, so using its own sources, Islam does not, I know we conveniently call it one, and in fact, this is an error. Islam calls itself a deen. When you look at the definition of deen, it is a political system. Deen is a political system with legal ramifications, right? Religion, remember, is a minor, if even a relevant part of the deen. So now, moving on. Divine revelation controls human reason. Okay, divine revelation, the word of Allah, controlling human reason is the only path to law. In other words, you making up man-made Western laws, as they would say, is not valid. God has to tell you what to do. So they deny that law can be created by human legislation, as we have in the rest. Now you have many, many Western scholars. Snook, Herr Gronje, Fitzgerald, Schacht, and Liebeschny et al. propose to assume that besides the pre-Islamic Arabian custom, Right? Jewish law is an obvious origin of the Sharia. Right? Multiple scholars have come to this conclusion, this, and not just them. They share theocratic orientation, geographic, and temporal proximity. The Talmud have been, have been being completed about the time of the birth of Muhammad, and they shared common languages. I will go into depth into this later again. I will come back to these points and expand. The most important early Islamic law school, the Hanafi school at Kufa in Iraq, not Mecca, was close to the Jewish academies of Surah and Pumbedita, where scholars studied the Talmud throughout the formative period of Islamic law. In fact, there were 12 Jewish seminaries at that time in Iraq alone. And there were numerous of these Islamic and Jewish seminaries close by. In fact, some people migrated from one religion to the other. And notice, Eastern or Talmudic Aramaic was the lingua franca of Iraq for centuries after the Arab conquest. Hence, the preponderance of Aramaic and its presence within the Quran. I'll pause here. 
Wonderful, brother. Thank you so much. Again, this is really fascinating to me because it's stuff that I grew up learning about or sometimes read about, you know, and uh, I mean, I have to be fair, uh, unless, like you stated it earlier, I mean, in fact, I went to Umm al-Qura, Jamaat Umm al-Qura, the University of Umm al-Qura, with the intent to now get a degree in the field to become a judge at some point. But I can't say that every Muslim really have uh, takes that path or every Muslim knows every single thing about these rulings. That's why they always want to refer to the imam or they want to refer to uh, a more learned person. But that doesn't mean also they want to deny what they're told. If, if they hear an opinion, they're going to follow it if they are sincerely seeking, of course, knowledge. But uh, if they know something and they go against it intentionally, they know also they're going to put themselves in real trouble. And oftentimes, sadly, it could be not only a jail or lashing, it could be even the loss of life. So I hope everyone who's watching, especially Muslim friends, are beginning to learn more and more about their own Sharia law and understand why it is absolute bad news as opposed to the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until we meet again next time, have a blessed day.